Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Who is Vinny Smile Chopra? Came to the U.S. from India with $7 in his pocket, and today he has created a portfolio of over $200 million in commercial real estate. He's a CEO of five companies, acquiring and managing diverse multifamily portfolio of 3,500 units, and his team self-manage all the assets. Vinny has walked the walk with over 26 successful syndications during multiple economic cycles, including downturns over 12 years. He has built a very extensive educational academy to teach and mentor investors. Vinny, tell us about this multifamily syndication academy. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you so much. I'm really proud to really talk to everybody about this extensive multifamily academy that teaches new and sophisticated investors how to use other people's money through syndications. That has been my world, to buy apartments from 50 units to 500 units and how to select emerging markets, how to do deal analyzing, investor education, other people money, syndication blueprints, everything I have learned, I teach in this academy and over 500 lectures and also how to manage the assets also and along with lots of great templates and PowerPoints, everything. And I personally also mastermind coach all my students every Wednesday. So to reach me, Whitney, all the students have to, or investors have to just text the word learn, L-E-A-R-N, learn to 474747 or call my team at 925-766-3518. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Amy Wan, and you're listening to a continuation of yesterday's show where she is answering many questions on the legal aspects of the real estate syndication business. Um, uh, another one that people mention a lot um, is 504, right? Uh, rule 504. Um, and it, it you know, on face, it does look like one of those rules where it's like, oh, suddenly I can raise money from non-accredited investors a lot more easily. Um, it's not really worth it, mostly because you have to go through a state-by-state -state process and it's very difficult a lot of times to make sure that you're still in compliance with the exemption because a lot of times, so, you know, um, a lot of times people raise under certain rules, like the five or six rules that I just talked about, because you can literally raise from all 50 states and not worry, right? Um, five of the four is not that way. Um, and so it tends to be a lot less popular. Um, very seldom do I see people raising money under it. Same thing as there are state exemptions, right? So everything I've talked about so far, these are all federal <clears throat> exemptions, um, which means, you know, all these, they, they operate under federal preemption. So that means federal law takes precedent over state law. So it doesn't matter what the state says, except for the fact that at the very end, you have to like pay them this, you know, blue sky filing fee. But, you know, Basically, if you use the five, six exemptions, you're good in all 50 states. If you use a state exemption, you are basically limited to the, not only the rules of that exemption, but you can only take investors from that particular state, right? And so also very seldom do we ever see people use state exemptions. Um, the only exception I would say is if the uh, investor, um, sorry, if the syndicator and their entire network of investors all tend to come from one state, right? So, um, and, and it tends to be states where there tends to be a lot more capital. And, and really across the U.S., there's only a couple of states where there's a lot of capital. California. Texas, New York, 
um, Illinois, Florida are some examples, right? Um, Wyoming to a certain extent after that, if, if you are in a state where there's not a lot of rich people, um, you're, you're probably definitely going to be using um, one of the federal exemptions. And so, yeah, sorry. So what's the, the, pro, uh, the pro, I mean, the positive thing of doing a 504? Why, if, if you were just one state specific, I mean, that would, then you would pursue that. But why would I, even then, why would I do a 504? Sure. Um, a 504 is just one of those things where it's, uh, it's kind of like a case by case basis. It might be good on this deal. Um, uh, but it might not be, I, I would tend to say, uh, sometimes it may be good for folks who don't have a huge network of, um, accredited investors, but even then, even when those folks come to me, I usually tell them, look, it doesn't matter. Just go and do a rule 506 B because at the end of the day, that one allows you to take money from non-accredited investors, but you're still working to build up your, um, your list of accredited investors. And, you know, I know it seems really difficult in the beginning, but the truth is that real estate is a long game. You're never just going to do one offering, right? And so you always have to be looking for the future. So if you go out today and try and build up your network of accredited investors, it might not work for your first deal, but for your second deal, your third, your fourth, at least you have that base to begin with versus, I feel like when you're using some of these exemptions where it doesn't force you to go out and build up your network of accredited investors, it's kind of like, it's a temporary fix, but it's not good for you long-term. Um, and that actually dovetails nicely into some of the other exemptions I'm going to talk about. So the last two I wanted to talk about are Regulation CF or Regulation Crowdfunding and Regulation A+, right? These two regulations are basically... Um, used by people who are at the the um, polar opposites of their real estate syndication career. Okay, so regulation crowdfunding. <coughs> sorry. So regulation crowdfunding um, is probably one of the newest crowdfunding rules, um, and basically it allows the syndicator to raise up to one million dollars and change per year, so every 12 months, right? Um, and you can raise it from a large number of non-accredited investors. And they don't even have to be sophisticated, right? They can just be like burglar Joe Schmoes. Um, however, this is a situation where there is a little bit of mother may I involved, right? So there is a certain amount of legal paperwork you have to fill out and file with the SEC uh, before you go out and do your regulation crowdfunding offering. Um, it, this one is called a Form C, and it it doesn't you know it doesn't have to get approved by the SEC or anything. You just you really just have to file it. It's you know near instantaneous. Um, but the other thing is you have to um, do that offering on a broker dealer or registered funding portal. And I think right now there's probably 40 of those, right? Um, they all have to be licensed and registered with FINRA. So this is much more regulated. They will all take some sort of fee, right? Um, right now for those 40 portals, there are not many that concentrate in real estate specifically. There's only a couple. Um, honestly, most of them concentrate on small businesses, startups, crypto, things of that sort. Um, I think the last time I checked, there was really only one that concentrated on real estate specifically. It's called Small Change. Um, and I think they only do it for debt. I don't think they do it for equity. Um, it do, things do tend to be a little bit more complicated if you're trying to do a, re, a real estate related regulation crowdfunding. But this is, you know, going back to what I was talking about earlier, 
this is why I generally dissuade clients against it, right? Um, a lot of people think, hey, I don't have a network of accredited investors. Let me start small. I know a lot of people who aren't accredited. Let me start with regulation crowdfunding. And again, I, I, I tend to point people towards the 56B um, just because, look, you know, um, the the $1 million and change limit every 12 months, it sounds great for a beginning syndicator, right? But, you know, one house, one single family residential house in California or New York is probably over a million dollars. Um, uh, one commercial building anywhere is probably over a million dollars. One multifamily anywhere is probably over a mil, uh, million dollars, right? Um, and even if you got financing it on it and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to spread that million dollars over a couple of different deals, right? Um, uh, it, 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 you know, it basically limits you at a million for the year. And you, and if you get good at this, you run out of that million dollars really quickly. A lot of people come ask me, Hey, um, can't I just do it a million for each project? Right. So I'm going to do a million for this house this year, a million for this house this year. And it doesn't work like that. Um, the million dollar limit flows back. Um, it doesn't matter what entity you're doing it with. It, it matters who are the directors and officers behind this project, right? And so um, if I wanted to uh, open 10 LLCs to take down 10 different buildings, um, if I do, you know, uh, $500,000 for the first one under this exemption, and then set, uh, I try. I want to do seven hundred thousand dollars for the next one. Well, suddenly I'm in trouble, right? Because collectively, um, so long as I'm, you know, essentially the same management uh, in the LLC, uh, it, it basically flows back to me. I personally am, am limited to a million dollars every twelve months. So it just, you know, it 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 tends to not lay, I think, a very good groundwork for people who are not just trying to start their real estate syndication career, but um, trying to, you know, have a long-term tra trajectory. And the last thing I just wanted to mention is Regulation A+. And Regulation A+, you know, it's at the it's at the opposite end because this is really for experienced syndicators who have a great um, influencer presence and have uh, you know, a great marketing team. Uh, so Regulation A plus allows you to raise um, up to $50 million every 12 months, right? And $50 million is a lot. However, you need to file paperwork with the SEC um, beforehand. And now they actually have to qualify or approve your offering. And that's a process that t can take minimum four to six months, right? Um, because there usually tends to be at least one to two rounds of back and forth. And every time you go back and forth, it's, you know, it's another month, right? Um, and that's for a regular offering, not for something that's more novel or complicated. Um, you can raise from the crowd generally, right? You can advertise, um, you can generally solicit, um, but there are investment limitations, right? So depending on what your net worth is, um, you can only invest a certain amount, uh, investors can only invest a certain amount every year um, under Regulation A+. Um, so, you know, this tends to be better for uh, syndicators who are doing funds, right, uh, that will go on go and take down a lot of different properties that they haven't identified yet. It does not work well when say you have one ski resort that you need to raise $50 million for. Um, and the reason being is because often you have a purchase contract um, that says, Hey, I have to bring the money to the table in 45, 90, a hundred days, whatever it is. And if it's going to take you four to six months to get approved, you know, the timing is just not going to work out. You're, you're going to, you know, lose that purchase contract. Um, 
The other thing is a lot of people think that they can go out and be like, oh, well, I'm just going to do a little bit of digital advertising and then I'm going to go raise $50 million and it's going to be so great. Um, that, that's not quite the way uh, investment works, right? It doesn't matter if you put ads out there, all this comes back to trust. And, and I'll actually talk about this in the next episode. So this is why I say it's better for more experienced syndicators as opposed to beginners flat out. Um, so those were the main rules. Um, and if I can just you know, give any, any quick tips around how you use them, I would say rule five, yeah, rule 506B, it's good for anybody, right? Rule 506C, when it comes to real estate syndicators specifically, it is good once in a while um, to bring in more traffic and um, to entice people. Um, but you, there's no, it's not necessary to do on every single offering, right? Um, oftentimes people will come in through some sort of ad that they saw for a five, six C, but then they kind of sit there. They want to, you know, it's the trust factor again. They want to learn about the syndicator a little bit. They want to see a couple of deals. And then later, um, once you have, you know, now established that pre-existing relationship with them, um, then when they start to see your 5, 6, C, uh, 5, 6B deals, sorry, um, then they might invest in one of those, right? People don't necessarily come in right away and they're like, okay, I want to drop right. like $10,000, $25,000, right? It takes time to build that trust. So 5, 6C really is just a really great way to advertise more than you originally could um, uh, and, and to act as a funnel, but they may not actually advertise in that deal. Regulation crowdfunding does not tend to work well for real estate folks that I mentioned. And, you know, to the extent people use it, it's really beginning syndicators, right? Um, regulation A plus, polar opposite. You want to be very advanced. You want to be an influencer, have a great marketing team behind you, have many lists of people who have already signed up with you and invested with you in the past because it's very hard to just make something happen out of nothing. I could see a 506 C uh, or you tell me if I ha already had maybe a successful business uh, and you know, with like a large following, I don't know, I'm selling some other type of product and I've got 50,000 people signed up, you know, that are getting this email uh, marketing, you know, for a totally different industry and product. Yeah. But now all of a sudden I could come over here and maybe do a 506 B and, and blast this offering out to that 50,000 people just, I mean, really to, even if all of them didn't invest, which obviously they wouldn't, but at least they know we're doing this over here. Right. Um, you right. So, so five, six C, uh, tends to be good for that. Um, if it's like a restaurant business or something like that, regulation crowdfunding is also great for that. Um, just remember that when you're bringing folks in from five, six C or a plus or C, uh, CF, um, and you're bringing them into your 506B funnel. It's not just anyone who came through the pipeline. It's people that, you know, you qualified them to a certain extent. You established that pre-existing relationship with them, right? Because we certainly don't want to bring people in um, on 506C and then, you know, uh, you know, blow the 506B exemption because we funneled them in through the wrong way. So we want to be careful about how we do that. Awesome. And what about, uh, um, you know, needing a PPM and, and uh, you know, should, should we talk about that now, you know, or do we need a yeah. PPM for all of these and, you know, or not? Yeah. So, you know, typically the documents a real estate syndicator needs is a PPM or a private placement memorandum, which is basically like a 60 to 100 page document that discloses every single risk you might possibly encounter um, so that people don't come sue you later um, and, you know, lays out everything very clearly. So people also don't come see you later. Uh, there's a subscription agreement and then there's, you know, operating agreements. And then to extent that there are foreign investors, um, sometimes there's like a foreign, um, you know, questionnaire that, that uh, foreign investors get. Um, now, you know, a lot of times people don't realize when they are required to have a PPM versus, um, when it's just best practice, 
typically it's always best practice to have a PPM, um, especially for rule 56B and 56C, right? Now you're only required to when you're taking even one non-accredited investor, right? So if you do a 506B and it's all accredited investors only, or you're doing 506C where everyone has to be accredited, technically you don't need a PPM. The reason why even large institutional, um, very fancy investors do it is because it really is a CYA measure. Um, and I know we're running out of time on this particular podcast. Maybe, maybe I can talk about it later on um, in a subsequent show. But um, you know, a lot of times I'll see people attempt to draft their own from a template that they found online. And it's like, they're doing a single asset syndication, the template's for a blind pool and it doesn't work, right? The language doesn't work. Um, you, a, a PPM is really great for CYA. Um, one of the best examples is once I had a real estate syndicator come to me and be like, oh, um, someone is very upset. They're talking about legal action. And one of the first th things you can tell them is, oh, okay, you want to sue, um, uh, you want to sue me on this deal? That's fine. You have to, you have to sue, you know, the entity that you invested in, um, and uh, when you do that, uh, it's actually going to come out of your distributions because, you know, uh, the, the entity is going to be the one paying the legal fees and it's going to indemnify me and the manager personally. So if you, if you sue, it's actually really just coming out of your pocket, right? And so there's a lot of little tiny things um, that are structured into the deal that way that um, incentivize and disincentivize certain behaviors. Um, so really, it, it is a best practice to just make sure you do a lot of CYA. Nice. Now, uh, we better cut it off <laughs> for this one, Amy. Uh, it's been great. Yeah, I really appreciate how you appreciate how you've laid all this out. And I know the listener is going to be much, much more educated now and understand why they need what and, and, uh, you know, maybe not have that thought of coming to you saying, I want to do a crowdfunding, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, and, and so uh, thank you again. And uh, I look forward to having you back shortly to go into thank some you. other topics. Thank you. <laughs> I hope that, yeah, and actually you should tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn oh, more about you. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So they can basically find me. My name is Amy Wan. Last name is W-A-N. They can find me on all the regular social media um, channel. So I'm on LinkedIn. Amy Y. Wan um, is my LinkedIn, my Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Um, uh, the website is bootstraplegal.com. Great. Thank you again, Amy. And I, I hope the listeners will connect with you and go to Lockbridge Capital and connect with me. Also go to our Facebook group so we can all learn from experts like Amy uh, and grow our businesses together. And we'll talk to each of you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.